This is another in our series on medical innovation in Israel and focused on the Institute for Medical Research Israel Canada. My guest is Howard Cedar. Welcome to the show, Howard. It's mm -hmm. Howard or Chaim. Which do you prefer? Chaim. Okay, Chaim it is, because I'm a Chaim, you're a Chaim. Though in Canada I'm known as Howard. <laughs> Uh, you came to Israel way back in '73, which was you moved here on you took you moved here in Alia. Was that a, because you got an offer, because you were a Zionist, or why? Uh, I I guess first of all, a lot of us who grew up in America in the Jewish community had this uh, pull towards Zionism to coming to Israel, and that was strengthened a lot when I was in medical school. And I took a trip in one summer to visit Israel. Which year was that? This was in 1965. I see. Before the Six-Day War. Before the, way before the Six-Day War. I was a medical student. And uh, I came here, and I just completely fell in love with the country. And uh, then I went back to my studies. And about a year or so later, I met the person who would ultimately end up being my wife who actually had been in Israel at exactly the same time and had fed, fell in love with Israel exactly in the same way. And we sort of, at the, at the spur of the moment, decided that's it. And she was American, American too. American, bro, yeah. Uh, she has, a, she has um, Israeli roots because her mother actually was uh, born in Israel. I uh, see. So that's why Sippy it was? Sippy, yeah. right. So, and so you had that idea in mind when you're finishing your, your MD and PhD. Right. And then the army came along, the American army came along, and uh, there was this, it was still, they were still fighting the Vietnam War. And uh, anybody who had gone through medical school had essentially gotten a deferment from the army. So people in my class, for instance, who finished all had to go and got drafted into the army uh, when they finished. And but you I, served in the labs, in the military So I, labs. I was lucky, and I got accepted to what was known as the Public uh, Health Service, which is a branch of the military that allows you to do your service for two years, but not, uh, not armed services. And I was fortunate to work at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, uh, and that way fulfill my service for the United States. And then right after that, immediately after that, in fact, the Army actually shipped us uh, to Israel. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and, but did you, you, had you decided to be a researcher then, or because you came immediately to Hebrew University as a researcher? And when I went to, my, my background is that I first studied math at, oh, I see. at MIT. Oh, at MIT, that's right. You, then you went to NYU. And then I decided that I wanted to be a doctor. And as soon as I got to MIT, they offered this program to MD PhD program. Oh, that's was was a, this just was when the they were starting it. Right. They, this was the first time that the program was offered. And I, actually, I was the first person in America to finish with a doctorate I in that, that program. Yeah. I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah. Um, and so already in medical school, I had a lot of research experience. And uh, I, I realized then that this was my calling rather than the clinical work. Yeah, actually, I think that the ultimate reason I didn't go into clinical work was because I found I didn't really have the proper empathy towards patients. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a different of, explanation uh, for uh, my. It uh, <laughs> wasn't so much the lack of empathy, but when I dealt with, uh, <coughs> I was in medical school. When my brother and I were in medical school, I didn't have the diagnostic skills. Is that right? <laughs> That's what yeah. I was going. Yeah. Too abstract, you know. Philosophy yeah, is smart. I can, un I can understand yeah, that. So it depends on what your disposition. You think because you're smart, you should be in well, medicine, right. but in fact, you're not suited to it. Yeah, I discovered that all my patients who lost their, all my patients lost their patience <laughs> with me. <laughs> yeah, it was not for me. Yeah, no. It's it's <laughs> interesting how we come to those different yeah, discoveries. I, I I have the joke that I save people's lives by leaving medicine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but getting on to your research, did you get right into genetics uh, very quickly? Or? So there also, I was very fortunate. I went to a laboratory at the NIH um, where they, uh, the laboratory of Gary Felsenfeld, and he was working on DNA. And really, there weren't that many laboratories 
doing this so-called new molecular biology. And not only that, but he was doing this molecular biology on DNA of animal cells, of human cells. And up until then, most of the work had been done in bacteria. So it was a real opening, a real opportunity, which maybe I didn't realize it then, but looking back at it, uh, it was a real golden opportunity. And so you then took that, and so you must have been one of the pioneers in Israel then when you came here. So when I came, I came to Israel. Uh, when did you get the Brenner chair? That comes oh, that later. was much later. Right. In the late 80s? In the, sometime in the 80s, yeah. I don't remember when. Um, when I came to Israel, there, I don't think there was anybody working on, on the, the DNA in animal cells. And there was certainly nobody working on what we called then chromatin, which is the, the structure of, the, it's the DNA together with its packaging, with its structure. Um, and we were one of the first laboratories in the world to work on this, not only in Israel. Um, well, so how did you get into the, sp I mean, you, you make your mark as one of the famous scientists in the world, not just in Israel. You have the Wolf Prize, you have at the Israel Prize earlier, and <coughs> you're very esteemed, but you make it in a particular area of the transformation of messages, etc. cetera. Um, it, how did you get into that specific area? So again, when I, did, when I was at the National Institutes of Health, we were working on something called chromatin, the structure. Right. And we came to the conclusion which was a really a, a, a big um, breakthrough in understanding that if you try to figure out what controls genes in an animal cell, the most important thing is how the genes are structured. And we sort of discovered that all of the DNA in an animal cell is packaged so that it's really not accessible. So all the machinery of the cell that's needed to read the genes, to read the information, can't get to the DNA. So it's a closed system. It's closed. And when, when a gene is turned on or used, there's a process of opening it up. And so this important idea of accessibility, we developed in these studies. Right? Oh, I see. Um, and this is true until today. I mean, the, the, the concept is one of the basic concepts of modern molecular biology, that gene regulation in animal cells at least, and in many other organisms, is controlled by what we call accessibility. Um, and so with this, we came to Israel. We came um, about a month before the Yom Kippur War. Uh, which was a, not only a big shock, but made everything a little bit more difficult. Um, it was very, very difficult to get the lab started. I was here at the same time. You were here also, and so you so know what it was like. India, well, no, I was, I was just here for six weeks, mm -hmm. so it, and then I left. So I, well, I, did, I wasn't here during the war. Yeah. So it, it, was, it was hard to get things started. But um, we started working in that direction. And that ultimately led us to this idea about DNA methylation, um, which then occupied our laboratory for the, the rest of our lives. Well, that's right. <laughs> well, you're called the father of yeah. DNA methylation, of course, in all the literature when you read about it. C can you briefly explain DNA methylation, and then, then we'll take a break. OK. Um, I guess the simplest explanation of DNA methylation is that you need in the body, because we have multicellular body, every cell is doing something different. But every cell has the exact same genetic information, the same uh, book, the same encyclopedia that we got from our parents. And there has to be, or there have to be mechanisms for controlling these genes, which ones are on, which ones are off, in every particular cell. What's on in an eye cell is not on in a skin cell, and what's on in a, in a liver cell is not on in a brain cell. 
and there has to be mechanisms for controlling this. And basically, DNA methylation is the, the, the father of these mechanisms. It basically, it's a chemical switch. It turns you it off. put it on to a piece of information, it turns that information off. You take it off that information, it turns that information on. So it's a real switch. Uh, we'll take a break now and come back to switching. Okay, great.